Greetings. All right. So I've been meaning to do this for a long time and uh, getting around to it. So here I am. All right. So I'm going to build a machine. I'm sorry, not a machine. There's no moving parts. Uh, this is a, um, a container uh, which will contain water and, uh, um, you know, washing soda by Arm & Hammer. And uh, the parts, the I'm going to, it's, it's for a process called electrolysis to remove rust. So, you know, if you've watched the channel so far, there are a lot of things that are rusty. I deal with a lot of old things and, uh, you know, try to repair them to the best of my ability. And to remove rust, there are a lot of ways to do it. You can use like more, um, you know, more toxic chemicals. I'm trying to minimize that as much as possible. I know that it's impossible because of the nature of what I'm doing, unless I just don't do it at all, period, you know? Uh, there's only some limitations to being green in this capacity. So this is what we need. We need to get some wash and soda. We have uh, four of these like hooks. Um, let's see what we can give you. Uh, here we go. So they're quarter inch by four by, I'm sorry, quarter inch by four and a half inch clothesline hook. I have four of them, four of these clothesline hooks. I gotta get some wire. This is uh, braided wire, and uh, it's 16 gauge, 25 feet. Okay, that's the part number right there. The form number six. Five zero three seven six zero one, and then we need uh, eight of these. This comes in packs of five. We can get a whole lot more. Okay, and that's what they are. They are set screw coupling. I'm going to use those to hold the metal rods and the wire around them to keep the negative charge. I'm sorry, the positive charges all the way through. So I have two bags of these. Um, then uh, these rods here, I use them in construction. Um, I got, they already, they come pre-cut like this. They might be a little too long for the application, but you know what, it's totally fine. I'm thinking over time, I'll just push them down as they start to, um, they'll also, because of the process that happens as the rust is removed, this becomes a sacrificial piece of metal and that will slowly disappear. So I'm hoping that I can use this for a long time and I hope to continue to make a lot of stuff. All right, so with all that in place, we need to have a container, right? So I'm gonna use um, just a bigger plastic container. You'll see what it is. I gotta figure out how many gallons it holds because there's a ratio of this to five gallons, okay? All right. All right, so we have a, um, we do like four pieces of wood here. And I wanna, let's get the size of this bucket that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, this looks like uh, with the overlap, it's gonna be about, oh, we'll do, we'll do 23. 23 feels safe. So 23 in length is what we're going to do with the overlap. And, uh, oh, yeah, anyway, you'll just see that. Okay. So we're going to do 23. Well, that's pretty close. Hmm. Did I just use that. Let's see. Like that? Yeah, I think that'll work. Good. All right, so I'm going to cut this to match. What I have set up is the wood with against this block right here, stopper, and that will help me get the other piece to be exact same length. I don't have to measure it, so it's a good little trick to use when you're uh, doing woodworking. Um, so don't forget your uh, 
forget to use your, uh, oh, well, looks a little, a little, a little tight there, didn't it? Yeah, so, so probably want to back it off a little bit. Just looks like it was a little too much. Things move a little when you tighten them down, these metal pieces. So. And it's not like super true, uh, this side of the wood. This is a rip cut, so rip cuts kind of, uh, they get a little off. All right, that's good, right? And uh, so we put that there, we get the other one here. And don't forget your, um, your respirator and your glasses. If I use a respirator because I don't have a really good ventilation system here and dust catching system. So anyway, respirator and glasses, go for it. Let's do it. Right, now that we have the tops cut, we want to do across the middle, so something like this. Yeah. So in between here, right? Now these need to sit out like that because we're going to drill holes inside of them for the rods, for the um, rebar. So I'm going to go out like that. Just enough so we can drop the V-bar down. Okay. Let's see what, we're, see what we're dealing with here. Again, this is another fine finished piece, so it doesn't really you know, be too, too perfect. It can kind of be rough with your estimates. Okay. So about that. We'll do, because that's going to sit in the middle over here and the middle over there. Right, this setup is called a gang cut. And uh, you do gang cuts when you try to get the same cut over and over again. I'm um, looking for my glasses. Right, here we go. So I have this set up with a stopper here just to help me, um, you know, keep this on the piece. It's too long for the end of the other one, end of the stopper. So got that on. Respirator. Glasses. Looks good. So this looks about right. We're going to do like that, like that. And then we're going to like get these all attached together. So to do that, go like this. Change your angle a little. Something like that, and then since this is going to be the top, we'll, yeah, this side's cuter. Yeah, let's keep this cuter side here. Okay, that's going to be the. This is going to be the top, right? Yeah, this is done with the cuter side, and that means what we'll do is just flip that over, flip that over, flip these over. Place the we have to put some blocks here to hold it in place and to keep it from sliding around. So that's the whole point of this. Okay, so let's just uh, 
get this here. Let's see what we're working with. So we can so that way we can have lots of space on the sides to overhang things to, to come in. Yeah. Let me sh can you see what I'm trying to do? Uh, yeah, I'll bring around this side here. Okay. So what I'm trying to do is get these in, right? Because they're gonna have a rebar they're gonna have rebar that's gonna be drilled I'm gonna drill a hole through and I need to have some space okay okay so that's perfect so we're gonna have a little bit of overhang on on the outside on the outside right there but we need to have the room to drill down inside okay so that's good. I like it. We can pull it back a little. Uh, bean anal. Sorry. Bean anal. I totally understand. It's like if this is a showpiece, but you know. It's hard to turn it off. Okay, so there you go. So that looks good. And that's all pushed in. That's perfect. All right, good. Let's lift it off. I'm going to mark it. Okay, wait, hold on. Yes, um, one more time. Okay, so whatever I do, I can definitely bump up all the way to the end to try to uh, hold this together. All right, good. That's uh, something like this. You know, like a block that goes across like that. Goes across like that. I should hold it together.
to figure out uh, the diameter of that and which little bit will actually work for that. Five, four, five inches. Or you can get it in meter, millimeters. It's in millimeters. Okay, so. It's pretty. Too small. Close but no scholarship. Really thought that was going to work. All right, so that's not going to work. I'm going to need a bigger. Let me try to get up. One sec. will actually work. No, it's too close. Let's go up a little bit more. Let's do five eighths. I think five eighths is a good. Yeah, we're gonna do five eighths because it's nice and uh, it's much bigger. So we're gonna do five eighths. I want to do some measurements with this um, because this process of removing rust requires like line of sight it's going to be really important to have things line up in a way that no matter where you put the piece in the process can have some access to a path towards the uh, uh, rebar so what I was thinking um, I'm going to use eight pieces of rebar two here, two here, two here, and two here. I should have just bought ten to be honest with you. Um, two, four, six, eight, ten like that. Uh, I did not, so <laughs> we're gonna do what we do what we can do, right? So here you go. So what I was thinking is uh, this will sit on top that goes inside like that and this will clamp and hold it on and then the wire will also push against it and um, to get this right I want to do a couple things let's measure this to see how big this is right, so this is around 23 right and this is going to be in the bucket, so it's going to be in the bucket from, so 17, 17 is what we have, right? So for 17, we want to do, uh, let's see, what do we have? Eight and a half is going to be the middle, right? Go. Let's just do. It'll be four and a quarter. Would be uh, from here. So be four and a quarter like that. 
and then four and a quarter from here. Like that. So it's going to be the center. And I'm just going to use that same line straight across to right here. Give us that, and then let's measure off the sides over here also. What do we have? Looks that is nine, nine and a half. So that means we're looking at four and a quarter. Sorry, it's nine and a half, right? Yeah, nine and a half. So five. I'm sorry. Four and a half would give us nine. So nine and okay. So four and three fourths. Right here would be the middle. That means we do two and. center line and this side is one one two three four five six seven so this is seven inches from here to here. Cool. All right. And that's it. So do the same on this side. We're going to mark this off. So uh, I want to put Same line down here on this side. Okay. So now we're just going to drill those holes on each of the sides, and we are good to go.
switch to the uh, 5 8 spade bit instead. I think I'm going to have a better, uh, just a higher velocity cut. Forrester bit's cool, but it just doesn't, uh, doesn't go as fast as I need it to, so. Yeah, glasses. to the uh, 5 8 spade bit instead. I think I'm going to have a better, uh, just a higher velocity cut. Forrester bit's cool, but it just doesn't, uh, doesn't go as fast as I need it to, so. Yeah, glasses. I have a small situation. Um, what I noticed was the screw that comes with this does not um, see what happens. It, it's screwed all the way down. <laughs> it doesn't, and these don't get any smaller from the source Home Depot, which is what they said to me. So I was thinking of a possible set of solutions. I got these. I was thinking maybe I could put these instead in there there are number 12 by 24 by three fourths of an inch in length uh, it would have been nice if I could get a smaller one but I don't know if that would even work so either way these will fit the threads will fit that thread pattern there the problem is it sticks out a lot so then it's like loose right so I was thinking maybe I can put this through it like that this connector, I'm not sure if it'll work or not, but we'll give it a try, all right? Another solution is this. I could abandon this altogether. Just put that around it and then tighten it down. Just stick this, these connectors underneath it. That's another choice, another path I can go. Um, I'm not really sure what's the best way to go about it, but I'm going to play around with this and uh, bring you back when I figure out what feels best. I've taken the uh, connector and I placed a larger screw on here. The wire itself now has this connector on and I'm thinking I can go like that and screw that down. Let's test it. So go in like that. Right. 
Now, my concern is that that, you know, being that the way it's not super tight, that's going to be an issue with like keeping uh, continuity. Uh, hmm. I don't really know. I guess I can just test it when it's all put together, but I don't want to waste too many of these trying to put them together. Anyway, you see what the problem is? Okay, cool. Uh, think about it for a All right, I want to show you a continuity test to see how successful we're going to be. <laughs> Fail. Anyway. Okay, so this is set to 20 K ohms. And let's see, hold that up. So I'm going to test this to see continuity is okay it's zero that's good right so if if I have a good connection from the end of the wire to the metal itself then we know that continuity is pretty good so let's test it shall we um, okay so it's the end of the wire here gonna break this. <laughs> uh, try that. Okay, so here's the end of the wire. And I'm gonna the polarity doesn't matter so it's black or white doesn't make a difference. If I should touch this I should get to zero. See? So we have good continuity on the uh, Rebar, which is zero. This also the conductors. This also conducts, so we also have zero. So we're good with the way this is set up. Um, what we'll do is uh, just continue to uh, check and see as we build this out. If everything stays connected with uh, some continuity. Okay? Great. I saved it. Okay, so now we're going to uh, show you in real time how I'm going to build the rest of this out. It's not super complicated. Uh, once you see me do it, uh, I will just say it to you that uh, I'll turn the camera off and you just can replicate it. It's the same thing over and over. So get your rebar. Slide it in. Okay. Use this wire's length to figure out how far you need to go. Okay. That looks good. Yeah. Take this. So the proper way to do this, you know, I think it's with I think it's called cold fusion. I think, maybe. I'm not sure. Metal fusion. But there's a way to press these together that are more um, permanent. But uh, for this application, I'm not uh, not worried about it. Okay, so from here to here looks good. And we're gonna take uh, this connector here and remove Remove these these screws. Okay. And then we'll replace them with uh, with these screws.
That's part number 493098. These tend to be a little difficult at first, they need to be started. Just to get the threads going. Slide it down, put that into there. Same for the other. So that's that, and uh, if, everything is, if everything is well, we should have continuity between these, so let's check and see what we got, shall we? Okay. So, multimeter. This is one, we'll touch the leads together. Point zero, that's good. So, go like that. Should be able to touch this here. Oops. Should have touched that and that. Oops. It gives me zero. So, we're good to go. We have continuity all the way through. So the connection's solid. I like it. Um, see no issues with it. Cool. So resistance is pretty good. It's pretty close to zero. All right. So I think that should work for now. And then what we're going to do is replicate that all the way around, and then. Uh, brought you back to see the uh, final process <sighs> all right so you get your pieces cut like that uh -huh. so I take this out like that hey any, any great Game of Thrones fans over here yeah I bet you are some of you are probably like no way I've never seen that show I'll never watch it never will <laughs> It's okay. This is not for you. All right, so I thought about how fascinating this problem. This is like a, this is a really interesting problem with like uh, morality and its inconsistency. And it goes like this. There are, I'm sorry, one man's utopia is another man's dystopia. Yeah, sounds familiar? No? Okay, good. Look those words up if you don't know what they mean. But you should, at this stage of your existence. At least, so I hope. Um, but if you didn't, yes, the utopia of one person means like, okay, this is what I feel like heaven should look like. Or the most divine place possible that I can think about. This is what it, it would look like. These are the things that should happen, you know? Now, for some people, it might be, you know, a camel and 12 virgins. Who knows what the heck you're into? I'm not the one to say. I'm just saying. That's what, hap that's what 
you know, sparks the fire in biology in certain people. For me, no so. I often find that the discrepancies in the way people perceive what's divine and what's good, or what's desirable or what's optimal is quite vast, actually. And because of that, you end up with this, like, very interesting problem. Like, you ask yourself, well, how do people even get along? Knowing that they have such, like, vast differences that they're trying to work through, you know? Well, the answer is, civilized society creates this opportunity for you to try to, like, say... It's a self-serving situation, you know? You want to not act like a fool, because acting like a fool means, like, potentially your own, like, you know ostracization of some sort, whether it be like sort of some sort of like um, termination of your um, privileges from certain people and groups, right? Or the actual um, incarceration of your uh, of your person in a, because of the legal system, right? So you have a social pariah and potential like uh, you know incarceration. Never good things, right? Now, all that is enough to say keep the control, to control the impulsivity of the adult, of the individual. Uh, and that maintains a certain level of civilized society so the individual can get the most out of it to the best that they can. Right? That's how things work. Now, the problem with this is that if you are not feeling like you want to play nice, you end up losing out on all privileges, and that's not going to be good for you for you in the long term, right? Now, this is where it gets interesting. So let's go back to the original um, original postulate. I say that one person's utopia is another person's dystopia, and this all goes back to Game of Thrones. So some of you can almost predict where I'm going to go with this. Right. So Jon Snow, right? I'm sorry. Back up again. Let me go back to Khaleesi. Now Khaleesi has an idea that she can create a world, a utopia, right? That is much better than what it is. Which, you know, her nickname, what? Breaker of Thrones, right? It's a pretty cool nickname. I wish I could do that. I wish I had dragons, you know? Go around freeing a lot of people. Especially people in an open-air prison. You know what I'm talking about in the Middle East? Yeah, that one. So, can't even talk about that without having, like, uh the world come down upon you like if you are the worst person in the world. Either way, as I digress, I, so she did a lot of work, you know, she freed a lot of people, helped a lot of people, right? And in doing so, she killed a lot of people too along the way, right? Some, you know, were definitely obvious strategic murders and others were you know, what we would consider collateral damage, which sucks because who wants to talk about collateral damage in any capacity or be on the receiving end of collateral damage in any capacity? I, for one, don't. Right? But what I do know is that the world, the civility that I'm experiencing, that you are experiencing, right? The stability that you are experiencing and I'm experiencing right now, that I can do something silly like this or you not hop on my back and ride off on me like I'm some shuffle of yours, right? Comes from violence. Lots of people. Lots of violence. Lots of people died to help me be the way I am and to cultivate my own capacity to become a better person. Because prior to that, people thought that I was a pre-Adamite, less than human, right? Now, we fast forward a little bit, right? We say, like, okay, now we understand a lot of people died to make my life better. So it seems like progress is not, especially with humans, doesn't come without cost. It doesn't work that way. Now, Khaleesi made a choice. She made many choices, right? And overall, I feel that if you pay attention to the character, her desires for a better world was one that is going to be a utopia that most people share. You know, which is why she had such a strong following. Now, Jon Snow, on the other hand, he kind of misses out on his, like, uh, say, uh, education on human psychology. The character just doesn't really get human behavior. He doesn't understand that 
you know what? If I do this, it's possible then it's going to create a chain reaction of negative, you know, repercussions. I don't know what he believes. He believes that what people are uh, innately good. Well, you know what? They're not. People are opportunists, and the situation is best to describe and predict what a person will do. What is the situation? That's where people don't seem to understand true human nature exists. What will you do under certain situations? So Jon Snow miscalculates what he believes is his uh, ability to share the truth with certain people and not have them use the truth in a negative way. Now, guess what? That's a really complicated problem because we have this thing called transparency. Some people like it, right? They always advocate for it. And I'm telling you now, the ones that are so into it are the scariest ones. What you abhor the most is what you adore the most. And what you abhor the most is probably what you abhor the most within yourself. So one must be very careful when dealing with someone that's like that. Now, take into that consideration those things that I just said. What we end up with, right, is a character that is poor at predicting people's behavior, right? His very own actions, his, his idea, this divine idea of his human nature is so far flung that he cannot even begin to accurately, say, predict people's behavior, right? He suffers from, like, you know, idealist paralysis. No, not really. Just idealist. Idealism. He's not even paralyzed by his idealism. He makes stupid decisions that paralyzes him, which is totally different. It's unfortunate, but it's the reality of him, of his, right? Um, so what do we do with a character like that or individuals like that? Well, we leave them to their own devices, right? Because they are fairly unpredictable and they are fairly problematic, period. And because of that unpredictability, what we end up with is like someone that doesn't seem to understand the importance of allegiances and has some strange ideas that all people are... You should be treated equally. Well, that's not how it works. If you think that a mother of two across the street from you, and you, a mother of f five, and again, this pays homage to a, the, uh, the trolley experiment, is going to say, place, be placed in a situation where she has to sacrifice one of her two children f to save three out of the five of yours, right? Ultimately, cause in a situation where or you lose all five or the other neighbor loses all five of their kids most people most mothers will not make that sacrifice even though the greater good and that same person with the two kids would say you know what i want to make sure i save as many kids as possible in the world i love all the kids well not really when it comes down to it if your kid's gonna die versus your neighbor's kids which, you know, ultimately, the scenario gives you an option to choose the one that would save the most lives. Most people, most mothers, parents, will save their kids. It's totally normal. It's healthy. It's expected. You know, it's biology. No big deal, right? And that's where most people kind of mess up in their reasoning skills. And that's where Jon Snow, over and over again, makes bad decisions, right? And people don't understand that... That character is flawed in that way. He's, uh, he has poor reasoning skills in the way he understands people's behavior and what he should expect and how his actions are going to cause his own turmoil. He could have saved all those people in Westeros by just doing one simple thing. Shut the fuck up. That's it. I don't need to tell the truth. I know what the truth is. I love this woman. How does he lose by telling the truth? He doesn't. He did, I'm sorry, how does, he, how does he win by not telling the truth? He doesn't win or lose. He actually, I'm sorry, he actually wins by not telling the truth. He doesn't, in any capacity, lose because he didn't tell the truth. He still gets to love the woman, right? That he's grown to love, right? Which, by the way, the psychology around their romance is pretty odd because, for one thing, even though he finds out that they're related, that shouldn't turn off his biological impulses to try to... for coitus. It just doesn't work that way. He's already too deeply enmeshed emotionally and physically with this woman. So for him to just say, oh, well, we're related and we're not going to have a relationship is just silly. Well, anyway, you get the point. 
I've gone on too long and I'm happy you listened. I think we have this all negative um, connected. You can see there's continuity all the way through. We're going to go ahead and place, um, I'm sorry, the positive will go here. Uh, and I can't foresee any issues with these rebarbs sticking out with positive electricity going through it at all. Nope, not one bit. All right, cool. Hey, thanks again, and I'll bring you back when we build the part across for the to hang the parts. Uh, the pain and suffering of reason. Okay, so I can, can do something like that. It'll be hanging like that. Um, what do we have here? Would diameter make sense? What we want to do is just uh, kind of drop it in the hole and see. What does. Oh, okay. It's a fairly tight fit. So we're looking at a 15 64ths. Very low tolerance, so uh, that works for me. Headlamp free for a second there. Alright. Get them in the middle. Well, roughly anyway. Now, why don't we get the middle? What does it take? It's 17 and a half, so. Let's see. 8 and a half would give us. So, it's 8 and a quarter in here. Ah! Uh, To, uh, let's see, 16. Yeah, eight and a half right here should do it. Okay. So. This piece of wood. I don't know why I drilled into it. Ugh, lame. So, oh, by the way, this is what we're working with. If you want to see again, can you see that? Sorry. Yeah. No, yes, come on. There we go. So, one quarter by inch by four and a half inch clothesline hook. All right. Skip off. Slide that through. So there we go. We have that, and we should be able to hang something from it. Like this. So my first thing I'm thinking of trying to clean or de rust. is a muffler. Oops, uh, can you see that? Mm -hmm. All right. So the first thing I think I want to clean is this. This is a, a muffler from that Craftsman 
trimmer that I'm working on. You'll probably see it if everything goes well with life. I'm gonna have to clean it first. So I'll put in the ultrasonic cleaner, get rid of all this oil, and then I'll proceed to um, take the actual uh, rust off of it. All right. I was thinking it would be a good idea to get rid of these top parts of the pole. Now, you know, not exactly the best design to keep it that tall because it's gonna be it's gonna be electricity flowing there. I don't think it's lethal, but. Either way, I think we should cut these off, and um, if you have a lot of a, uh, if you're going to use this a lot, it would, it, I would say leave it long because these are sacrificial nodes, and they're going to corrode, and I'm thinking eventually you're just going to keep pushing them down until they're all gone, you know, but whatever, here we go, I don't think I'm going to use it that much, if I do, it's okay, they're pretty cheap. So let's go ahead and cut these off, shall we? That's about as much fun as I'm going to have cutting these things off. All I can tell you is uh, safety third. I'm going to leave these nice and long. All right, well, let's just uh, continue with this. And we need to connect these. So.
Really not that hard. I swear it's not that hard. Hmm. I can double this up.
Okay. With all these connected now, right, I want to check the continuity. So let's see what we have. Do that. It's the setting it's on. Oops. It's a shadowy down here. See? There you go. 20 kilo ohms. Okay. 20 kilo ohms. And I don't know if you'll be able to see it or not. Can you see that? Yeah, that's not good. How about that? Yeah, that's possible. Okay, so I want to just check and see if I have continuity across this. If everything goes well, that should be at zero. So I go here and here. And I am at zero. Yep. It's zero. Okay, we are good. We did it. All right. And uh, so what I'm thinking is uh, this. The battery will just, cl the uh, negative will just clamp onto this. Okay, and that will provide the negative charge to the pieces that are hanging below. Like that. Cool. Alright, and then any of these we're going to attach the positive to. So this will be longer because what will happen, um, if we have another row right here, we can just attach that to it screw it on and then we'll have uh, you know we can just keep on building them as, as as needed that's the plan anyway well that's about as much fun as I'm gonna have cutting these things off all I can tell you is uh, safety third I'll leave these nice and long all right well, let's just uh, continue with this and we need to connect these so Okay, with all these connected now, right, I want to check the continuity. So let's see what we have. Hmm. So to do 
that. It's a set in its own. Oops. It's like shadowy down here. See? There you go. 20 Kella ohms. Okay. 20 Kella ohms. And I don't know if you'll be able to see it or not. Can you see that? Yeah, that's not bad. How about that? Yeah, that's possible. Okay, so I want to just check and see if I have continuity across this. If everything goes well, that should be at zero. So I go here and here. And I am at zero. Yep. It's zero. Okay, we are good. We did it. All right. And uh, so what I'm thinking is uh, this. The battery will just, cl the uh, negative will just clamp onto this. Okay, and that will provide the negative charge to the pieces that are hanging below. Like that. Cool. Alright, and then any of these we're going to attach the positive to. So this will be longer because what will happen um, if we have another row right here, we can just attach that to it screw it on and then we'll have uh, you know we can just keep on building them as, as as needed that's the plan anyway I got this hanger and I'm gonna use this <clears throat> you can see it uh, it's just bent like that I'm thinking of putting it on like this hang it down I should really get two things on there or more you know, submerged. So this will be the first thing I'm gonna place in the uh, tank. So something like that. See, and that should do it. Okay, holy electroly electrolysis. Sorry. I don't know. I think we're ready to test it. The only problem is, not inside. Got to do it outside. Okay, good. Let's do it. Get your better view. And that would be it. Okay. And what you can see is uh, because of its uh, position, any rust, these needs, these sacrificial nodes need a line of sight help take care of all the rust so that should do it you know what we should do let's test this and see if we have continuity that's actually a better idea uh -huh. what do you think do we have continuity I don't know This here, can you see that? Hmm. It's going to be a hard one. Okay, so we have that. And the piece. Okay, so these look really well. Continuity wise, I'm touching the uh, metal hooks. Hanger looks good. Hanger's good. That doesn't look too good. <laughs> So, probably want to 
maybe a scratch this a little. So I think what would be a good idea is where it's connected to. Um, That's got good continuity. That's got good continuity. I'm touching this. Hanger's got good continuity. Couldn't see I was touching the hanger. Okay. The piece itself. Oh yeah, yeah. It's not too bad. Alright, so I just touched the piece and I got really good continuity on that. Um, so I'm, you know, let's try this again so you can see. All right. It's got good continuity. The hook has good continuity. This hook has good continuity. The hanger has really good continuity. The piece that I'm trying to clean has good continuity. All right, so everything looks good. We should be good to go. All right, so <laughs> we got to do some numbers now, right? Um, uh, the for every gallon, you should have about a half a cup to uh, one third of a cup of the um, laundry booster. This is by Arm and Hammer. It's a super. It's all. It's wash and soda. I got it from the laundry section of the uh, grocery store. So, the container in front of you here is a. It's rated for 73 quarts or 69 liters. Now, 73 quarts ends up being something like, a, it, it's around, 17 quarts is equal to 18.25 gallons. Um, so if we have every five gallons, we should use a half a cup or a third a cup. I'm gonna use a half a cup of, a, of a, the wash and soda. I'm going to go like this, and I should have, uh, I, if I divide 18.5 by 5, that ends up being uh, 3.65, yes, 3.65, and that's, I'm going to multiply that by 0.5, so that gives me uh, close to 2 cups, it's like one point. Eight two five eight two five cups. Okay, so let's just go ahead and use two cups of baking soda. Uh, since I'm using uh, in between, now you know. Let's just do two and a half cups of baking soda for this entire container of water. Okay, so let's do it. So here we go. Uh, I'm gonna pop this open. Okay. So, I'm hoping that I can probably just uh, cap this off and uh, you know reuse it and reuse it and reuse it. That's the plan anyway. If it's a practical size, then it is. Come on. Oh, the weird stuff that causes long videos <laughs> right here. Mm -hmm. Come on. Two. 
two. That's two and a half. Okay. Now I'm going to add uh, some water to that. And uh, I'm going to try to do, I'm going to do these two pieces first. I have a whole set of like old tools I wanted to get the rust out of. So I'll do those two, the muffler from the trimmer. Okay, we'll attach those like that. And we'll put the negative charge onto this and positive onto any of those. All right, and that's how we're going to do that. I'm going to use my battery charger and I'm going to put it at six, six volts. So I'll show you that. Okay. So here's my setup. Um, obviously, don't touch anything because it's all plugged in and on. We have the positive. You can pick any of those sacrificial nodes to attach to. The negative is attached to the actual piece itself that I want to remove the rust from. I have my, uh, you can see that is on six volts, 10 amps, and it's in the hold position, so it's just been feeding electricity to the piece for some time. And then, let's go over here. We're gonna, um, I'm gonna give you a little close-up so you can see the bubbles. A lot of bubbles coming off of this. See that? All right. And that's the uh, byproduct of this process that's really um, toxic and it's also um, very flammable. So, again, it's really wise to do this outside, not inside. All right, well, we're going to take it apart, uh, pull, pull it out, and see what it looks like now, right? Okay, so I'm going to time-lapse this a little bit so you can uh, see me take it apart, unplug it, and all the good stuff, and see what we're, see what we're working with, all right? All right. That's what we got. That's pretty cool. Yeah, what do you think? I think we did a good job. That's amazing. All right, cool. Let us just go ahead and uh, get a rag, wipe this off because uh, we don't want these things to rust. All right? So here's my setup. Um, obviously, don't touch anything because it's all plugged in and on. We have the positive. You can pick any of those sacrificial nodes to attach to. The negative is attached to the actual piece itself that I want to remove the rust from. I have my... Uh, See that is on six volts, ten amps, and it's in the hold position, so it's just been feeding electricity to the piece for some time. And then let's go over here. We're gonna um, I'm gonna give you a little close up so you can see the bubbles. A lot of bubbles coming off of this. Can you see that? Okay. 
And that's the uh, byproduct of this process that's really um, toxic and it's also um, very flammable. So again, it's really wise to do this outside, not inside. All right, well, we're gonna take it apart, uh, pull, pull it out and see what it looks like now, right? Okay, so I'm gonna time-lapse this a little bit so you can uh, see me take it apart, unplug it and all the good stuff and see what we're, see what we're working with, all right? All right, so that's what we got. That's pretty cool. Yeah, what do you think? I think we did a good job. That's amazing. All right, cool. Let us just go ahead and uh, Get a rag, wipe this off, because uh, we don't want these things to rust. All right. I just want to go ahead and uh, put a little force steer through this, make sure uh, get as much of the water out of the uh, actual muffler itself. I'm going to have to work fast because uh, uh, flush corrosion is beginning to happen.
want to get as much of the uh, surface as clean as possible. So I got some acetone and mineral spirits. Uh, this one's almost done. Either or will work. Uh, so let us use this so I can try to finish it off since it's almost completely finished. I don't know if you have to wear your safety glasses, goggles, whatever you need to do because uh, you don't want these things to splash in your eye. Okay. Hopefully I have enough. Okay. What I'm trying to do here is make, it, make sure I get rid of all the oils and grease off my hands or anything that might have lingered that's, that touched it because I'm going to prime this and then I'm going to spray it. Get it silver again, you know? That's the goal. thinking about how fun it would be to try to coat this with the zinc, you know, using a similar process where you keep dip this in vinegar, submerge, submerge this in vinegar, have a uh, zinc anode, and then connect the positive to the zinc anode and the negative to this piece, and just coat it. You know, that would be so awesome. Uh, I'll get around to it. We'll do another video at some other point. <laughs> There's enough trimmers here that need to be uh, rebuilt from scratch. Just because I want to learn with you. Share my process and my knowledge. Alright, so that's that. I think that's pretty clean. We did it all with this. It's tons done. I gotta get a new container. Um, Alright, so now that we have that, we're gonna go ahead and uh, prime it and then spray it. All right, great.